1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Uh, Chris will be happy, happy, happy to um, give you a Bible. So here we go. This morning's message um, is one that I've titled, The Ministry of Ministers. And the reason why is because Paul, from chapter 3 and into chapter 4, is kind of giving us somewhat of a, if we had gone to a conference or a retreat, he's given us some very amazing nuggets to think about this morning and previous times in teaching through 3 and 4. And just to recap a couple of things, and in chapter 3, we see that Paul spoke to those in Corinth, and he spoke to those who um, he had expected to be a little further along in their walk than what they are. And he actually called them carnal. He said that they were acting like unbelievers in their actions, and the idea that Paul was thinking was that they would have grown and they would have matured in, in their walks by this time, but Paul has recognized that they haven't, and so, you know, he's, he's brokenhearted. I want you to understand Paul's heart in writing First and Second Corinthians. He's really brokenhearted over this. Verses 5 through 9, we see that Paul says, hey, we are all part of God's plan that that." There are those of us who plant and those of us who water, but God is the one that adds the increase, right? We can be the person who says, man, I've been ministering to this person for three years. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along the next day or whenever and says, hey, would you like to give your life to Jesus? They go, sure. And you're like, man, what happened? Three years I've been ministering to this person and they never said anything. And then all of a sudden, yeah. Now this person comes along. Remember, Paul is saying, hey, there are those who sow the seed and there are those who water the seed, but yet it's the timing of God to adds the increase. In verses 10 and 11, G, uh, Paul speaks to us about the only foundation of which to lay our lives in, and that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, that is the foundation. And so um, he says that's the only way that their strength would come through Jesus and that it is to be built only upon Jesus Christ and he alone. Verses 12 through 15 of chapter 3, um, then Paul says, well, these are the kind of materials you want to use in the building of your spiritual house. You've established it already with the foundation of Jesus but now, how are you going to build it? For those of you in the building trades or have ever dealt with building trades, you know the importance of good, sound building materials. Foundation is also oh important. But yet, how are you building your house spiritually? That's when Paul refers to the temples of the Lord. That's who we are. Verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3. He says, listen, we, we God's children, are those living temples. So, how are you building it? Are you building or basing your life, building those areas, those walls within your spiritual house? Are you building them with good stuff? Not with wood, not with stubble, not with hay. The things that are going to burn once they're tested. Verses 18 through 20. He says that, listen, we can't fool ourselves in thinking that the wisdom of the world is to be in priority or better than the wisdom of God. Right? Right? The wisdom of the world offers us nothing, but only the wisdom of God and what he offers us influences you and me and affects you and me for goodness. The world has really nothing good in, the, in wisdom to bring to God's children. Finally, in verses 21 through 23, he speaks about the fact that, man, humanity, man, and the world... They have nothing that we can boast in as God's children. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing that is of the world that is bragging worthy. Nothing that we could brag upon that is so great about the world versus how great God is. And that we've already been given so much by Jesus. Just by the mere fact that we have Christ and Christ is in us. We have Jesus. And by that, when I was in the Appalachian Trail, and when Jean and I were there, and I, I, I thought of this verse, and I was like, Lord, all of these trees, everything around me that I see, your beauty belongs to me. It's all mine, because God has given it to me. 
And he's given it to you. Or that's what Paul is saying here in, in verse 22. It's not ours yet in ownership. But soon enough, it will be. But it all belongs to the Lord. And because God is in you, and we are in Christ, it's ours to behold. I don't have to worry about what's going on out there, because it all belongs to us, says Paul. And so now Paul leads now into chapter 4. And in chapter 4, Paul is now bringing the attention of those in Corinth to the things that were going on in the church. And now he's coming back full circle to try and bring some understanding in the way of Paul's ministry. In the way of his ministry and what he's been about in Jesus. The first five verses alone of which we're covering this morning, Paul ties it all together to help them understand that although he's an apostle, we call him the Apostle Paul, big A apostle, right? We call him the Apostle Paul, and in that, the word apostle is that authority that we say, oh man, he's the apostle of God. So there's a certain amount of authority that comes with that. But at the end of the day, Paul says this, just take away the title of apostle, please. Because at the end of the day, we are all just servants and faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. That's it. At the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, when things are done, when we take our final breath on this earth, we are all only servants of the Lord. Think about this. Paul was in this church when he founded this church. He was the pastor of this church. New converts are coming in, both Jew and Gentile. And in that, 18 months, a labor of love, he, this church was birthed. Through his efforts and the efforts of other servants around him, God blessed them. Remember, those watered, those, those planted, and God added the increase. Amen? That's what happens. And so in this, for 18 months, he's with these people, these first believers in Corinth. But I've got to believe that since he's been gone from this church for around three, four, or five years, he's been gone. He's writing this letter from Rome. He receives a letter from the household of Chloe, which is in chapter 1, verse 12. And in that, he receives some distressing news about what's going on within the church of Corinth. And the news is from Chloe's household that there are divisions and there are isms and schisms and there's factions going on and this group following this person, this group following that person. And all of these things are happening. It's like the church within is being divided up. And Paul, being that pastor, his only response is, I think, his heart breaks. His heart breaks for those that are in Corinth. So much so that he's called on the Lord to pen First and Second Corinthians. And in these two epistles, in these two letters, Paul is going to bring encouragement. Paul is going to bring exhortation. Paul is going to speak the truth in love. And Paul, knowing his responsibility unto the Lord for those in Corinth, he's going to speak some truth into their lives. See, because Paul understood the power of God. He understood the power of God in the lives of people. And because of that power, his heart is broken and he says, Why, Lord, is this the case? It would be as if I was called to another work in the world. And I got a letter from one of y'all. Man, Tom, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. This is what's been going on since you've been gone these last few years, man. And in that, I would say, wow, I, you know, goodness, everyone was in such unity. Everyone was in such love. Everyone was in one accord when I left. And like, Lord, what has happened? And my heart would break for you all. My heart would be broken for, the, for those in Williamsburg. Same thing. 
Same thing that if you were to leave and you were heard distressing news, you would also feel the same way. I pray your heart would break. Let's think of Nehemiah. When he received the news of his, those three guys or two guys that came from Jerusalem to report to him, the walls are down. The gates are burned. What was his response? He wept. He wept. He was in anguish. And because of that anguish, he was called to do one thing, and that was to fast and to pray knowing he had to go to the Lord. Do we have that kind of anguish for others? That when we hear of things, are we in anguish because of our love for others? That was Nehemiah. That's Paul. And so Paul then pens this out under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the first five verses. I'll read them. You follow along, please. Chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, that's an underlying word, by the way, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Another underlying word. But with me, it is very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels, or you might say intents, motives of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. Paul starts right off in verses 1 and 2. And he starts off with, let everybody know. Let everybody be aware of this. That's what let a man means. He says, let all the people be aware. Let everyone know about us, says Paul. Meaning, figuratively, as he says in verse 6, he and Apollos and the ministry that they're involved with involving Corinth. He says, I want you to understand and to seek to really get to know us in this way. Not in the way that is involving with divisions and factions and stuff. He goes, no, that's not of the Lord. But get to know us as servants. Get to know us as stewards of the Lord. Get to know us in the fact that we are no different from you. He also uses another word, consider. Now that's interesting because that word consider means to conclude or to reason. Now you know it as well as I do. When we conclude, make a conclusion, or we reason, it takes us someplace, does it not? It takes you and me into a path. We're going this way, we make a conclusion, and now, oh, now I'm going this way. You know? When we were, Gene and I, hiking this last week, we were sore afterwards, by the way. Oh my gosh. But when we were hiking, we knew there was a direction to go, and we came to a sign. We read the sign, and it said, this path, the boulevard trail, 2.7 miles. It's like, all right. Gene's like, let's do it. And I'm like, no, no more. Mercy, mercy. So we had to, in that sense, make a conclusion. Are we going to stay? Are we going to continue? Which way do we go? The sign helped us. And this is the same thing. We reasoned. So it's reason or conclusion that causes us to go into a direction, in other words. And Paul says us, so he is referring to he and Apollos and their ministry. And so he's speaking about, you know, all leaders, all pastors, all, in this sense here, Paul the Apostle. But let's just call them servants. All servants. All stewards. That those in the body of, the, of Christ, those in the church that they come to, we come to an understanding of the role and the ministry of those in leadership or those 
in a pastoral sense, Paul is talking about his ministry within the church. Because first and foremost, he says, we are servants of Christ, says Paul, right there in verse 1. You know, we often read in Scripture this word servant, do we not? And we immediately then gravitate, we reason, we conclude, and we go to, in a direction, oh, doulos. All right? That means servant. Doulos. All right? A voluntary slave, a voluntary servant that we are all doulos unto the Lord because we have voluntarily signed up for Him to be our master. We voluntarily signed up for Him to be our Lord. He didn't put a gun to our back. He didn't put a knife to our ribs, but instead we voluntarily said, this is the best. Our God is the best God and we're going to follow him. And, and that's all there is to it. And so that's really what a doulos is. That's what that voluntary bond servant is. But that's not the word that Paul uses in the context of the scripture. And I found it very interesting as I studied this word. The word is hupertasi. And that, that really just means under rower or under oarsman. Wow, what, what is an under rower or an under uh, um, oarsman? I'm going to get tongue tied just to let you know. You see, Paul wants them to really know and understand that the role of a servant is be it pastor, be it minister. By the way, you're all ministers. Did you know that? Every one of you here in this room who, who, who are saved, you're all ministers unto the Lord. Your workplace, you're a minister. In your homes, you're ministers. Dads, you're, you're ministering to your families and your wife. Moms, when dad's gone to work, let's say, you're ministering to your children, those who homeschool or those who send their children off to school. They minister to them. You minister to those on your workplace. You minister to your friends. Are you ministering to your friends the things of God? Paul wants them in Corinth to know that me and Apollos we're just under rowers. We're just under oarsmen. We're just servants of the God Most High. I've got an image for you up on the screen that gives a little bit more of an understanding of what an under oarsman is. It's a military term that's been used, that is used for military life in the Roman army and really involving specifically warships. You remember that movie Ben-Hur? How many of you guys remember seeing Ben-Hur? Yeah, didn't he make being a slave really cool? The dude had great hair. The dude was buff. He was tanned. I'm like, wow, it's a pretty cool gig, you know? Look at, look at that dude, you know? But it was far from the Hollywood version of what it means to be an under oarsman or an under oarsman. In this, we're told that, and you look at the screen, that the ship had anywhere from one to three to possibly four different levels in that warship. Remember, battling speed, right? They used these ships, they reinforced the front bow so much that they could gain speed and that, that, that guy banging that drum would intensify and intensify the beating of that drum, making every stroke faster and faster so they can do ramming speed. They didn't just pop up the Re Evan route and say, well, you know, let's go. But instead, it took real manpower to make it work. They were seated anywhere from one foot above sea level to below. And let me tell you what, it wasn't all great being any kind of a servant under rower or rower on any kind of a battleship. The reason why is because that ship's sinking... Who's the last? Who are the ones that went down with the ship? The servants. Those that were chained to their seats. It wasn't like they say, oh, okay, under roar. Don't you understand the picture? Let's say the guy above you says, oh, potty break? Do you think that guy is going to go, oh, yeah, sure, no problem, man. Let's unlock the key. You can go to the water closet now. Just come on back. Take some water while you're at it. 
Absolutely not. It's kind of graphic and kind of gross, but guess what? Um, if you're an under rower, everything because of gravity on the top falls down. So think about that. That's what Paul is using as an illustration to get it within our minds and those within Corinth. He says, that's who we are. That's who I am. That's who you are. We are under rowers. And Paul is bringing this applicable to his own life and his own ministry. He says, man, don't, don't take sides. Don't be drawn to people because we're all only under rowers. Every single one of us. So Paul is speaking about himself and his ministry. Each of these roles, let's say for pastors or teachers or leaders within the, the context of church, are just servants of God's word and God's people. That's who we are. That's who you are. You are servants to one another, right? That's how we're to look at ourselves. We want to lift each other up. We want to consider others before ourselves. And each of us take our rowing orders, per se, from Jesus, who is our captain, right? He's the guy who beats our drum for us, does he not? It's the Lord. And so as he guides, if he gives us a direction or whatever, then we follow it. And we do it according to the pace that he sets us. Every one of us. A servant of Christ doesn't receive, I believe, their orders, his or her orders from the world. Because the things of the world are so cool and the things of the world are so great and bring in business practices and, and allow the church then to be a business and, and not a, 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 an organism that grows and changes and morphs itself. But instead of bringing in too much structure and too much of the world. Good things, but not necessarily in the house of the Lord. That's worldly wisdom. Paul talks about that in chapter 2 verse 6 of 1 Corinthians. But how do we do this? Okay. How do we apply that understanding of being an under... If you're not saved here this morning, if you don't have the blood of Christ on you, you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand what it means to be an under rower. You're saying, well, that's just kind of crazy. Why would anyone want to sub want to subject themselves to that? Why would they want to submit themselves to something as that? What an illustration, Paul. It's crazy. Only those who are saved, only those who have been then given wisdom of Christ through His Holy Spirit will understand. Paul says that in chapter 2, verse 13 of this epistle. You see, because it's at the time of salvation that godly wisdom enters you. It's at the time of salvation when we then begin receiving and understanding more and more, bit by bit, the mysteries of the Lord. Why? How can you understand it? Because of godly wisdom that is now in your life. Because of the Holy Spirit that is now leading and guiding you into all truth. Paul says, as Christ's servant, my orders, the beating of my drum, oh man, are only from the Lord, my captain. And as Paul is pastor to those in Corinth, we can say that it applies also to others in the context of church. The Corinthians, know this, man, the Corinthians did not like to hear from Paul. Man, they didn't like to hear from Paul at all. Why? Well, they, they didn't like the way he looked. They didn't like the way he sounded. They didn't like the truth that he gave in the way he gave it. Instead, they preferred Apollos. Apollos was one of them in a sense. He had the oratory skills. He had the vocabulary he had the polish and he had the panache and everything that went along with it. And they received from him. They loved his ability to speak as those Greeks did in rhetoric. Expounding on things. But not Paul. 
They didn't have too much, in a sense, regard for Paul. And you can look that up for yourselves in chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Chapter 2, 1 through 5 of 1 Corinthians. So Paul went through a very difficult time while he was in Corinth. He mentions then also in verse 1, stewards. So what's a steward? A steward is defined as a house distributor. Or you might say a manager. You might say an overseer, an agent, meaning a representative. Also pastor is part of that. Uh, leader, I would say, is part of that as well. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul had asked the question, what then is Apollos what, and what is Paul? But are, they are but servants who give you the good news as God gave it to them. You see, they're just distributors of what God already has given them. They're not manufacturing anything for themselves. Paul says, please, please think of me as a steward of the Lord's things. A steward is someone who's been entrusted to someone else's property. If you are a manager or you're entrusted with a role in a company or in the military or something like that, guess what? You are a steward over those things, are you not? You're a steward. And because of that stewardship, you're going to do your utmost to make sure that everything is taken care of, right? So whatever it is, whether it's in the home or outside the home or in church, guess what? We're all called to be stewards over those things that God entrusts us with and allows us that entrusting too. How does this look practically for us? Well, we know that the Apostle Paul submitted his life to Christ he yielded his life to his captain, Captain Jesus. That's, that's who he yielded his life to. Paul says, I'm just a steward. I'm a, I'm a slave in duty to God. But also, he's allowed me to be an overseer. Kind of like Jesus' agent or representative over his things. Even those in the church or the household of the Lord. Uh, can any of you, I think, we can think of an example of a really good steward who was persecuted. His name is Joseph, right? Joseph, rescued in a sense from Potiphar. And God's hand is upon Joseph and man, he makes Joseph, Potiphar that is, he makes Joseph the steward over his home. Everything about his home, he knew where it was. All Potiphar had to do was ask, hey, where's this? Joseph would know. But also in that charge of a responsibility over Potiphar's things, he was also charged and had responsibility over other servants. Right? So he was like the lead servant, if you will. That steward. And Potiphar entrusted him and trusted him to the operation, the management of his home and those oversight of those others who were also in his home. That's what a steward is. So, so Paul's duty, if you will, his role, is one of which he is an overseer of those of God's household or his family. And so they, while being under his responsibility under his charge, that human relationship and understanding of that, they were accountable to him. And, and in that, that was their choice, but that's why Paul is writing this letter. It's like, hey, this is what I hear and this is what I see as a remedy. It's going to be up to you to follow it or not. Here's some specifics. Paul, number one, dealt with the concerns of the household. So he's dealing with things of the church via these two epistles. Paul has made sure that their needs are taken care of. Paul managed, in a sense, the household accounts of the house of God in Corinth. While all under the accountability of his captain, Jesus. All under the master. Remember, Paul here is speaking about somewhat of what I call a practical role in the administration of God's house. Paul says, 
But even though I'm an under rower, just like you are, even though I'm that under oarsman, the role I've been given by Jesus is the role of a steward. Now notice this. I'd like to make it clear that being a steward and an overseer in this sense, as Paul intends it to be meaning, is not to be lording over. A big difference. It's almost like God has given him authority but with no power. Right? Because the power comes from whom? Jesus. The power comes from the Lord. But he's given him authority, but the power comes from God. So he's not called to lord over people. It's not what it's about. But he has accountability to them. He has responsibility for them. And he's a distributor of the things of Christ to the household or the family of Christ. You know, Paul is no different from any of us or any pastors throughout all history. In that Pastor Paul carries a mantle or a yoke of responsibility towards those he's been given responsibility over. It's quite a role. Dads, you know it. Single moms, you know it. Single dads, you know the responsibility it means to hold a family together and the responsibilities thereof. You know what that translates into. It's a great mantle of responsibility. And what does he say? He goes over the mysteries of God. Hmm. The things of God, in other words. But these mysteries are things that can only be shown when you have the wisdom of God to those who are saved. Some are his word, the spiritual truths through the scriptures, his people, God's family, his finances, God's provision, his household, God's resources. Paul and Apollos had been charged with three things, protecting, preserving, and distributing. That's basically it. Protecting, preserving, and distributing rightly the things of the Lord to his children. If anybody here likes to read, there's a great book that I'd recommend, two of them in fact. One is by the same author, Warren Wiersbe, and one is called On Being a Servant, and the other one is called On Being a Leader. I'd highly recommend it for anyone, especially those of us who are all called to be servants of the Lord. And one quote that I Love, and I quote a lot of on page five of On Being a Servant, says, God did not call us to be manufacturers. He called us to be distributors. We don't want to manufacture things for the Lord. That's his job. That's his, his role. But what he does give, all we want to be is faithful to distribute it out, right? Just distribute it out. Give it out. It's not of us. It's of the Lord. It's his stuff. Verse 2, here's the idea in that. When Paul speaks about a steward, he says, moreover. So he's almost like rising that above and saying, if there's anything else that is really equally or more so of importance, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Above all else, Paul says, a steward of the Lord is to be a good caretaker of God's stuff, right? And that just doesn't mean in the church. That means in your homes. That means the clothes that we wear, we take care of them. It means the cars that we drive, we make sure that they're serviced. That means the furniture in our home, we watch over. The carpets in our home, the walls in our home, the those things, uh, uh, anything that would be have given from God to you, we're called to be stewards of even those things, right? Why? So that they'll last. That we don't take on the world's wisdom of we live in a society of replacement. Oh, it's just, I'll replace it. No big deal. I'll go to Walmart, buy a new one. When it really didn't have to break or it really didn't have to wear so soon. Paul says, take care of things above all else. 
that's been entrusted to us, everything, faithfully. Faithfully. It's also our children, like we dedicated this morning, Shaley. It's our children. He uses the word required. And remember, he's not just applying this to himself, but he's applying this to everybody else who's reading this, this letter. The word required, remember, it's not lording. The word required here means desire, endeavor, require, or seek. So the require meant is that we as believers seek that for our lives. That we as believers desire that for our lives. Pastor John Corson on this text says, We're not called to be successful, only faithful. Right? Now, I had to wrap my mind around that because my thought is, well, wait a minute. If, if I'm not successful at what I'm doing for you, God, then I would count it as I'm a failure, right? Not according to the Lord because God doesn't say, be successful, Tom. Be successful in this ministry. Pack in a thousand people every service. He doesn't say that. He says, be faithful to show up for every service. Plug along, guys. Plug along. Plug along. That's all God says to do. Faithfulness also doesn't mean fruitfulness either. The reason why I say that is because when you think of fruitfulness... You might think of others in the Bible who have had, man, they ministered to people, they talked to people, people got saved. But how about the ministry of Jeremiah? Think about Jeremiah. How many years, guys, can anyone tell me, how many years did Jeremiah labor in ministry? It's 30. 30 years, right, Darren? How many converts did Jeremiah have? Five? Ten? Come on. Thirty years, guys. How about one a year? Okay? That'd be a great church plant, right? Thirty people in thirty years. All right. Praise the Lord. How about zero? Zero. So, there wasn't any fruit by our eyes that we would say Jeremiah was successful in ministry. And so we see those examples. Um, Paul seems to be saying here to us, I think that pastors or leaders or any one of us this morning, like stewards, are all stewards, are to be devoted to our master in the service of his, of the, of his things. So we're to be devoted to God in the service of the things of God. That's how it works. That faithful God has entrusted you and me to his things. And then in verse 3, Paul says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Whoa. Okay, some of us, and I even, you know, my first time reading this, I'm like, wow, that's kind of arrogant. Right? Right? That's kind of maybe borderline prideful on what Paul is saying. Hey, if you're going to judge me, man, I think it, the word very small means least, means really, really, really little. It's almost like I really could care less. It's kind of what Paul is saying. Paul says in verse 3 that there's really not to be any judgment by fellow stewards or servants because Paul's main desire is to meet only with the approval of Christ. And in verses 3 through 5, this is what I call the ever-changing human standard. Because what pleases people today, they will stone you tomorrow. Amen? I mean, that happens, right? Right? Man, you can appeal to the masses on Monday and by Saturday, whoo, you are toast. You are yesterday's news and they're ready to throw you on the altar of sacrifice. Paul starts off by saying, but with me. 
And what he's saying is like, as for me, as for myself, says Paul, I can see that you've already judged me. But Paul says, I really don't think too much of it. Understand, they had a very low approval rating of Paul. Very low. The word judged here doesn't mean just discerned or observe. But in the context of how it's used, Paul uses this word in the meaning to be scrutinized, investigated, interrogated, and questioned with the direction pointing towards blame. So they are playing both judge and jury against the Apostle Paul. And he says, hey, if you're going to bring me into a court, guess what? It's just man's court. And you're judging me. And that's just man's judgment as far as I'm concerned, says Paul. Paul says, man, whatever you think of me is fine. I know perhaps you prefer Apollos over me, and that is cool, but I'm not here to please you, says Paul. I'm here to please the Lord. I'm here to please Jesus. I don't want us to get confused, though, that Paul is not called to be pleasing. Big difference, guys. To please people and to be pleasing towards others is totally different. To be pleasing means to be kind to be loving, to be compassionate, to be giving of grace and giving of mercy. Yes, we can be pleasing towards one another. The third part of verse 3, he says, guess what? Please don't judge me. Don't convict me. Don't send me down death row because I don't even judge myself. I don't even judge myself, says Paul. I don't bring blame Upon myself, in other words. Because why? Paul is fully aware of his imperfections. Are you aware of yours? Are you aware of yours? They say a person that isn't has a very short-term memory. Right? That's the truth. Paul's aware. He, man, he can cut himself so much slack. Because he's so biased towards himself. Paul says... I know that if I do judge myself, one of these things comes into happening. One is, I'll be too easy on myself. I'll be too hard on myself. I'll be way too impartial. And guess what? Overall, I can't even be trusted to be my own judge. I can't. None of us can. Paul says, I am way too biased for me, and you're way too judgmental towards me. So Paul says, so then who do I truly receive judgment from? According to Paul, the only one to judge him is Jesus. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Meaning that, on that day, the day of judgment is when all people will confess and all knees will bow. God knows the intents of our hearts. Verse 4, Paul knows that he is not perfect. Paul knows he's not innocent. But Paul does know this, and we should all know this too. Paul does know that his own righteousness comes only from Jesus Christ himself. It's his righteousness imputed to us. It's his righteousness given to us, not Paul's righteousness. How can Paul really say that, though? Did he not persecute Christians? Did he not kill people early on? Did he not put people in prison? Paul isn't referring, I believe, to his before Christ days. Paul is saying, look at my ministry. Look at the ministry of which God has called me to. That's what I'm talking about, says Paul. Paul's not talking about his entire life, but he's talking about the sense of salvation and his service unto Jesus as his servant. His servant. 
This is what Paul says in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 18, or what is said of him. And when they had come, he said to them, You yourselves have seen what my life has been like all the time from the day when I first came into Asia. Paul says, I know that I may be aware of all of my imperfections and wrongs. Maybe. But I know that God sees all of my imperfections and faults where I or we may even see none. It's hard to look in the mirror, isn't it? To see the blemishes, the imperfections in our lives. Paul says, hey, I'm not free of any blame. That's why he uses the word justified. He says, yet I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. See, Paul says, I, I can see and I, and I trust that by God's grace, he will show me my imperfections and he ultimately, I can trust, will judge me righteously. Not according to the thoughts or ways of man, but according to him. And Paul is speaking about his time on earth in the sense of Things that were be done here in his ministry, but then also more so eternal judgment. He says, at that day, at that day when I'm before my Lord, he knows that even though I mess up, you guys ever messed up? You don't have to show me your hands, but yeah, we've all messed up. That we may not see our faults really clearly. Paul says, Jesus will judge me accordingly. Jesus will judge me righteously. And Jesus ultimately will judge me eternally. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, ultimately it's always the Lord. See, what is Paul doing here? Paul is not caving in, in a way. He's not passing the buck but he's just deferring in humility his case over to God. You see? He's not handing his situation or his case over to the people. He's handing it over to the Lord, Jesus. And he says, I trust you. The Corinthians, they were so proud and confident about their own thoughts and their own ways. So Paul kindly in a pleasing way, reminds them that they and he, he doesn't exonerate himself, are all subject to the judgment of Christ. Verse 5, he says then to wrap it up, therefore. So he says, in light of what I've said, says Paul, and being quick to judge and bring blame, that before your hearts, before your hearts, dear people, can be deceived, before you judge my heart, of which God is only able, Paul says, please, pass no judgment and blame on me. Paul is teaching them that we're to be careful not to pass harsh opinion on anyone's conduct. Why? Because, as I have found out many times, oh, and I'm sure you have as well, you don't know the whole story. Amen? You don't know the whole story. Because we most likely don't know someone's whole story, Paul tells them that soon enough, Jesus will, at his day of judgment, when his righteous judgment, that time for us in the Lord, will be levied upon every one of us, all his children. Then the second part of verse 5, God is going to bring his light and revelation Paul says, Jesus will illuminate and reveal the deep things of our own hearts. Paul, uh, the Lord knows the purposes of our hearts. The Lord knows the designs of our hearts. The Lord knows the intentions of our hearts will all be revealed on the day of judgment. Are we ready for that, guys? Paul says, Jesus knows everything about our heart. And he will be the only one to truly be able to judge us. None of us. Every one of us who is hearing this word today, either online or here in person, not any one of us can conceal or hide things in our hearts from the Lord. None of us can. Especially when it comes to our day. Our day when we see the Lord, that day of judgment. 
which is a meeting that every one of us will have when we die and we go to see Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord at that moment. Saved or unsaved, they will confess it. It's not good for those who are not saved. The last part of verse 5, he speaks about praise. Then each one will praise, each one's praise will come from the Lord. The word praise here that Paul is saying is a reward, is the idea of something that is due. Because Jesus, who knows our hearts, Paul means that the praise or that reward that we will receive from Jesus is real, true praise. And it's a true honest reward from the Lord, judged righteously in the righteous scales of Christ, not according to the unrighteous scales of man. So in closing, Paul's caution, I think, for us today, in these first five verses alone, are so evident, not only to the church in Corinth, but maybe to you and me this morning, that one, every one of us are ministers, right? Right? Every one of us are called to be ministers to the body of Christ and beyond. That every one of us are stewards of God's things. And that thirdly, let's look not to judge, bringing a guilty verdict upon others. Let's seek understanding first. Let's inquire. Let's ask some questions. Let's be a good attorney and find out What's really going on? I'll leave you with a verse this morning. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. It's the Lord, guys. It's the Lord. And so in that this morning, I think Paul brings to us a kindly reminder, exhortation, where our minds and our hearts are to be and absolutely who our ultimate judge is and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? You don't have to rely on my judgment of you and you don't have to, and, and, and vice versa. Isn't that a good thing? I think so. I'd rather rely upon the righteous scales of Christ in my life because He will judge me according, like Jeremiah says, according to my ways. There's freedom in that, guys. And that is the grace of God, is it not? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for this day. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this portion of Scripture, Lord. As it ministers to my own heart, God, I pray, God, even this morning that we would all just glean from your word. That, God, that you would help us focus on you. That you would help us be fixed upon you. And that, Lord, that you would protect our hearts from looking around from judging the way things are done or not done. That we would focus on Jesus and the ministry that you've called every one of us to within the body of Christ. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace in our lives, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. And we say all this, in the precious name of your son, Jesus, and all God's children say, Amen. You